Well, good afternoon, everyone. And apologies that I can't attend this workshop in person, albeit virtually. Um, when I when I first heard of the term twin and attended a number of meetings, it's going back a few years. It for me it conjured up images of of where's Wally and you know actually finding the twin and is this a twin or not a twin and you know should we twin or, or shouldn't we twin and I would imagine that these are all questions that that you'll have um, today and that you'll be facing and I hope to shed some light on how those issues have been addressed and the sort of theory and background and history of twins um, in the context or domain of mechanical and aerospace engineering. This, this riddle or conundrum if you want, or, or lack of clarity around what a digital twin actually is and what technologies are required in order to create uh, and maintain a digital twin has led to a, a recent Government Office for Science rapid technology assessment that really looked into what is a digital twin and developing a definition of that digital twin and assessing how digital twins are used um, across different fields and in the current UK landscape, um, in particular the research landscape uh, relating to digital twins. And we contributed, the University of Bristol contributed to this uh, rapid technology assessment. And as part of this, we produced a definition of a digital twin. The definition that was, was, was developed uh, is necessarily wordy, but is that the digital twin is actually a collection of one or more computational representations of the physical asset, um, the entity or the process, with a flow of real-time data from the sensors installed on that physical asset. The twin or the digital twin can then be used to, to monitor and evaluate the performance of the physical asset across its life cycle as part of a, a dynamic process with the ability to remotely interact with or control that physical asset. So there's data flow from the physical to the digital, and then there's data flow back from the digital to the physical. So closer inspection of that definition allows us to break down a digital twin into a number of elements or characteristics. Um, in particular shown here, we've got the physical system, but then we've got an interface where we have to capture the data and that, um, that sort of real-time data that will feed into our computational representation here. And there needs to be an interface to collect that data and there needs to be a means to handle that data and to, to synchronize or twin to take that data and twin that computational representation or update it to reflect the state of the physical system. We then have to use that computational representation in some way or some form to add value to support, for example, decision making or some form of intervention. Uh, we then have to determine that intervention. We then have to have a means whereby we can interact or control the, the physical system so that we can actually you know, update and one might say twin then the physical system with um, with, with the, the, the computational representation or the, or the digital. So that digital twin then is, a, is the data, it's a computational representation, it's a means to interact or control. And importantly, you've got four interfaces there that need to, to also be considered from a technical, technical perspective. So armed with our newfound definition, is this example a digital twin? So this is truly impressive that Porsche can you know, create a fully virtual prototype of a new vehicle. Everything from um, the body in white, structural performance through to um, you know, the, the CFD, the ride, the handling, the quality, the response of the suspensions, and truly impressive. And they can simulate that or run that on a number of real world environments, so the Nürburgring, for example, and get data which is pretty pretty close to that, um, which they would, would, would expect to achieve um, with, with an actual production car or the physical car itself. So is this a twin? While impressive, this is what we call a virtual prototype. So this is effectively the collection of computational representations which are in um, the, 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 the scope of that definition of the digital twin. So it's all well and good having a, a, a nice shiny definition uh, that we're all in uh, vehement agreement about. But, but what's the value of this? What's, what, what's the pedigree? Is this just a new fad? Is this the emperor's new clothing? Well, let's, let's examine the history of the digital twin in a bit more detail. So what, why, and how did we get to digital twins? 
Well, it, its origins can be traced back to, to the space race. And one of the reasons why Apollo 13 uh, returned to Earth is that they had a, a replica or identical um, physical model replica of all craft, satellites, etc. And the, the Department of Defense were very similar that anything in service, they would have an identical retain, an identical physical um, system. Of course, that's very expensive. So back in sort of early 2000s, um, NASA started to ask the questions of, is it possible to do this digitally rather than physically, and particularly the increasing number of assets and satellites in space? And the engineers at, at NASA, led by John Vickers, really came up with the, the, the lexicon and the constructs for what we know today as a digital twin. And that was all about you know, actually can we create a, or produce and maintain a digital model of the, you know, of, of the asset as is. So the condition rep replicating and representing the condition in almost real time of all of the assets. This sort of technology was taken on board, and we've got an example later by particularly aircraft manufacturers who are starting to look at you know, performance prediction and maintenance regimes of aircraft engines, safety critical products, um, hugely expensive and any downtime um, is significant for both the engine manufacturers and, and the um, airline operators. We in 2000, about 2014, uh, this was techniques of, of digital you know, digital twins started to permeate and be taken it, uh, into manufacturing production where you already had on the shop floor you would say things like SCADA system so you had all that data being collected and you had various you know models or representations of of the plant so really it was about augmenting those and being some of the um, some of the dimensions if you want or, or concepts of the digital twin into the a production or, or onto the shop floor in about 2016, we started to see these techniques, digital twins, um, being used in the infrastructure sector. So we've got the Centre for Digitally Built Britain at Cambridge um, and a number, a number of other sort of major initiatives and groups emerging in sort of 2015, 16, starting to apply condition monitoring and the steps beyond that of digital twins to infrastructure. And where are we, are we today? Well, I think there's lot, lots of research starting to look at actually is the digital twin just for in service or can we start to look at digital physical aspects of, of, of twinning earlier in the ever earlier in the process? So the first example here is, is a digital twin of a product and this is a the use of a or application of a digital twin to redesign and optimize a vehicle chassis. So in this case it's a race car and the original race car chassis was instrumented with hundreds of sensors. It was then driven um, around a number of race tracks and different driving regimes and a huge amount of data was collected and that data was then used to drive a redesign of the chassis and in particular a computational redesign so using what we would call generative design techniques and then a chassis was manufactured, it was tested, you know, it was instrumented, driven again, and that cycle was repeated a number of times until we ended up with the an optimised chassis in terms of mass, in terms of uh, torsional stiffness. And the chassis is shown here on the, on the right, top right, and you can see from that it's a very complex, very intricate chassis design that actually would be almost impossible to design that manually. By, by a human operator. So actually, the, if you want the data from the physical, feeding into the computational redesign model and the simulation then of that chassis um, to ensure that it can, it can handle the stresses, um, et cetera, du during racing, um, couldn't, is something that you couldn't undertake easily manually. For those of you interested, there's a, a YouTube link so you can actually see the, the car with a CNS, as they called it, the nervous system, um, if you're interested. So any slide deck or presentation on digital twins would, would not be complete without reference to um, to Rolls-Royce um, and, and in particular um, uh, gas turbines and the work done, done in the aerospace sector. So this is an example of a performance twin and in this case it's, it's engine health monitoring and Rolls-Royce have been investing in both modelling of the physics of engines but collecting operational data and analysing that operational data um, since, since really the 90s. Today, Rolls-Royce collect hundreds of parameters in real time, also on all of their engines. There's about 14,000 engines in service. And the, the current generation of engines are um, what we call connected to each other, 
operations and customers in a two-way manner and what that means is they're not just sending back hundreds of data data points they're sending back a, a certain level of data all the time and curating that but they can actually respond to particular requests to monitor um, particular parameters on the engine so if there's some questions being asked by operators or customers, they can actually go and analyze and make requests for specific data from, from their engines. They're also contextually aware of their operating conditions and demands. So the, the, the engines themselves have, have an awareness, if you want, in terms of their operation of what the flight path is, the logistics, what the operating conditions are, the weather conditions, etc. So there's, they can automatically you know, adjust to some autonomy in, in how they adjust and optimize their performance without the need for human intervention. Importantly, they're also capable of learning from, from what are called collective experiences. Um, so at, actually, you know, how do you optimize your own performance based on the performance of all, all the other um, all, all other engines? Indeed, for example, engines that have been on the same flight path um, in the last last or number of previous previous days or flights. So the, in this sector, in terms of for Rolls Royce, a lot of this um, is driven or has been accelerated, you might say, by the product service paradigm, which some of you may have heard of, which is powered by the hour, where airline operators they don't buy an engine anymore; they actually lease you know, or, or buy the availability of the engine. So for Rolls Royce, it's absolutely key that those engines in the aircraft are available, and there's no downtime. So a lot of this, the engine health monitoring, is about predicting the onset of any um, modes of failure or maintenance requirements so that those parts or that maintenance can be undertaken and is in place prior to that aircraft actually touching down at its destination. So the third example is what we call a production twin and this really takes your, your sort of production and operations to the next level. So it's building on the the, the, the SCADA and, and sort of um, operational systems that are typically in place within production facilities. So a lot of sensing that's already going on with the process in real time. And then that control room, taking that to the next level by bringing in the, the sort of multi-physics, multi-scale model or vir virtual model or digital twin of the plant itself, which enables you to do you know, more advanced reasoning around you know, impact the impact of changes or what if scenarios how do we drive that 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 uh, extra percent of um, process efficiency or how do we maintain our quality what happens if a, um, a material property changes or there's some change to the, to the to the inputs and that is again about in that sector really driving that continuous improvement and driving overall equipment effectiveness levels so for quality for process optimization and supply chain management a couple of examples just on the right hand side the lower example is actually a, a DHL warehouse where the digital twin actually we, we, you, you capture the you know all packages parcels etc where they are their location etc and that's about optimizing the flow through that warehouse um, to reduce storage time and to reduce you know picking order selection picking time so Looking at these these three types of twin used in in sort of manufacturing or uh, mechanical aerospace sectors, you know, leads to a question: When and why do we twin? And hope they've they've provided some insights into when and why. And I think the for me there are sort of five or six points, you know, as, as, as reasons or motivations to twin. First is if the system is dynamic, so the condition behavior and inputs environment are varying over time and you need to, there's a need then to keep an up-to-date as-is representation. Um, we'll see for a lot of these examples, systems themselves are high value or they're safety critical, so that becomes really important. Um, it's expensive to have any downtime um, and costs um, in, in uh, these sort of undesirable states. The third one or fourth one is around system control or intervention when you need that, but it can't be easily or exhaustively coded in or onto the physical asset itself. So you need some offline capability to undertake that reasoning and develop your interventions or, or control regimes, prototype those, trial those, test those, and then implement them back onto the, the system, the physical system. Um, the, the, the fourth or fifth aspect is when system models themselves might be limited, and there's a need to, be, to supplement those with real-world 
data uh, because actually the, the cost of modeling and the understanding isn't there to be able to create um, very high fidelity models so you can start to combine the two and fuse the two in order that you can generate that understanding and learning and the last point then is around scale and complexity and if there's such that it's difficult or impossible for humans to actually comprehend and, 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 and act on those in a tractable manner or time scale so we think about the the the, the, the race car chassis and essentially the twin is a form it, it forms a learning and feedback loop and allows you to accelerate the generation of that understanding okay thank you very much and i hope you you enjoy the rest of your workshop